Hi, I'm Sheila McManus. I'm one of the board chairs at the Teaching Center at the University of Lethbridge. And this morning we're going to be talking about the Instructional Skills Workshop. So joining me are Uta Wiedenkota from the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, Wayne Lippa also from the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, and Robin Bright from the Faculty of Education. Thank you all for coming. Now the ISW started in British Columbia in 1978. Um, the Ministry of Advanced Education in BC first developed it. It's now taught at more than 13 universities. There's 13 universities and more than that, um, more than that number of colleges across Canada that use the ISW. Here at U of L, the first one was in August of 2011, and three of us participated in that. Mm -hmm. And we became facilitators the next year. Um, and then Wayne's also been a facilitator since 2013. So we joke about it as a four-day boot camp for your teaching, but it's actually a whole lot more fun than that. So maybe, Wayne, I'll start with you. Tell us a little bit about what's day one of an ISW like? Day one of the ISW is a lot of learning educational pedagogic, pedagogical theories and practices. Um, you start off with a little bit of history about it. You start off, uh, then you get into um, sort of how to structure a lesson. The, the meat of it is really how to structure a lesson um, using the, what they call the BOPS methods, the bridge in, the objective, pre-assessment, participatory learning, and post-assessment um, parts of it. And then it goes into what some of those parts are, like what is an objective, what makes a good objective, uh, a good tangible objective, and using good action words versus uh, sort of vague, generic words that are hard to, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to evaluate. Uh, and then you learn about um, different sorts of active learning and, and um, what you can do to kind of get people, you know, actively learning versus just sort of passively learning from you. Um, and then it's uh, a lot about uh, different learning styles. Uh, so you kind of be aware that different people learn different ways. Uh, and then you kind of wrap things up with uh, uh, just a bit of discussion about you know, a few other educational things and then setting the, uh, the stage for the next three days, which are the mini lessons. And what the mini lessons are uh, is a 40 minute cycle uh, within the 40-minute cycle, there are uh, three, basically, roles. The instructor, uh, who is the one who's teaching the lesson. The facilitator, who is the one sort of managing the lesson cycle, making sure it, it runs on time. A and then the rest of the people are the learners. So uh, the way each mini lesson cycle works is that there's five to ten minutes for setup, uh, where everyone leaves the room except the instructor and the facilitator, and the instructor sets up the room the way he or she wants it to, to be for the lesson, and the facilitator helps. Then everyone's called back in, and uh, the instructor gives 10 minutes of a, of a lesson, a mini lesson of his or her choosing, a uh, topic of his or her choice. And uh, everyone else just learns and, and uh, learns the lesson, uh, while the facilitator manages the time, and because it's only supposed to be 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then after that, the last half of the mini lesson cycle is all about feedback. And this, I think, is the most important part of the ISW itself, is all the feedback that the instructors get. Uh, so there's five to seven minutes of written feedback where the instructor and facilitator leave the room and everyone writes down uh, what they thought of the lesson on these feedback forms. And then after that, everyone gets into what we call the feedback corner. And um, everyone, all the learners give oral feedback to the, to the instructor who has to sit there and be quiet and take it. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the good feedback, the constructive feedback, uh, and uh, well, the, what worked for the learners, what didn't work for the learners. Uh, and that, I think, is the most important part of it, is just hearing the feedback, getting the feedback, uh, and, and, and listening to it so you can hear it and, and you know, internalize the feedback. And uh, that is the 40-minute mini lesson cycle. And we go through several of those then over the next three days of the workshops. That's a lot of feedback over the course of a four-day workshop. And it's that peer feedback that we think is one of the really important parts of the instructional skills workshop. So Uta, as a facilitator, how do you make sure that all the participants get the kind of feedback that they want, that they can use? Um, what's the role of the facilitator in that process? It's really important that every participant gets the feedback he or she needs. So really the role of the facilitator is to mediate the feedback so that it's specific and tailored to each participant. There's not a one way of giving feedback. And Wayne already pointed out there are different forms of feedback. That's important. So there's the written feedback, the oral feedback, 
the feedback from the participants as well as the facilitators. And actually, there's also a videotape of the mm -hmm. mini lessons so that each participant can do some self-evaluation later and watch himself and draw his own conclusions of you know what was good or bad or could have been changed. So it's a variety of feedback. But it also is important that it's high quality feedback. And that's where the instructors play a role, not by giving the feedback, but really, sorry, the facilitators play an important role, mm -hmm. because they don't give the feedback, but they facilitate feedback from all the people in the room. And that ensures that the feedback is diverse and meaningful. Mm -hmm. And in order to do this, we have actually been trained for five days. We've had a five-day <laughs> workshop, and the five days were pretty much 80% of how do we get good feedback, because it is core to this workshop that it works well. So we have plenty of experience in understanding the participants, understanding their level at which they are, and asking the right questions to the other participants um, so that the feedback is constructive. The feedback is at the level where the participant can take it, not too harsh, not too soft. And also, it's a little bit challenging, but not too much. Just mm -hmm. as much as it makes sense to reach the next step. We also see that the feedback evolves. That's why mm -hmm. the workshop goes over several days. On the first day, we're all a little bit afraid, and we take the careful mm -hmm. approach, we're nice to each other, and then we know each other better. So on the second day, we can dig a little bit deeper. And on the third day, we can go crazy and try out new things, be innovative, creative, and get feedback on something we just tried out. So it doesn't matter if it's good or bad, but it shows us that we can go beyond our traditional teaching, and that's why it's so critical to, to build the feedback over the three days. And the one important thing that we also do on the first day of the workshop is we discuss feedback with all the participants. We establish mm -hmm. rules for feedback that everybody agrees upon so that we know when to stop, we know when to shut up and listen, <laughs> <laughs> and we know how to take it, and we support each other in it. It's also important that everybody's part of the process, so it's not a group giving feedback to one person who is the poor person suffering, but it goes in rounds, and we're all in the same boat. And I think that's what makes it effective in the end of the day. Yeah. And the variety of feedback can be a lot of fun, because another piece of this workshop that we really like uh, is that it normally brings in a wide variety of disciplines. And that's mattered to us from the very first ISW here in the summer of 2011 to the participants that we get now, is we often have, we like to get, um, a wide variety of disciplines. So how does that work? You might be getting feedback from someone whose discipline is completely different from yours, or you're trying to provide feedback to someone whose normal teaching life is very different from yours. How do the facilitators manage those differences? Well, it's a true challenge, right? And I have to admit, when I went to my first ISW, I was thought, this is crazy. It's not going to work. I'm so special. I'm a biochemist, and the way I teach is tailored to my discipline, and the others don't know anything about it, and they can't help me, and this is just a waste of my time. Sorry for being so blunt. I've totally changed my perspective. <laughs> but I have to acknowledge that on the first year, it looks like this, mm. right? But I now fundamentally believe that having a diverse group of people makes this effective. I don't think the workshop would work if it's only by a chemist, <laughs> not <laughs> at all. <laughs> because what it helps us to do is it strips away the content. We are all experts in our fields. That's no doubt about that. That's guaranteed. We've learned it, we've studied it, we have PhDs and whatnot in it. But it boils it down to the teaching and the how do we get our students to learn? Mm -hmm. Not what do they learn. Mm -hmm. We are expert on that already. Mm -hmm. You don't need to worry about it. But we need to worry about the how. And on that level, we are all the same. And when it comes to how do we let our students learn, as Wayne mentioned, it's very important to acknowledge the differences in our students, for example, the different learning styles, mm -hmm. the different methods we can apply as teachers. And so variety becomes a strength because it lets us play to the advantage of our students. And the more diverse the group of participants is, the more diverse the mini lessons are, and the more we can learn from each other because we can get ideas that would have never entered our head. Mm -hmm. And we can also see their teaching from a different perspective than they would have ever seen it. And that, again, is good feedback because we may have very different learning styles ourselves, and we can reflect the diversity of our students in the diversity of the ISW group. And it's essential to not only acknowledge this, but to also see that this is really making it stronger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, embrace that as one of the real positives of the workshop experience. And you get to meet people outside your own discipline, outside your own faculty, from totally different parts of campus, yeah. and sort of connect you know, as teachers. 
Um, Robin, we've also talked a lot, so we've got, you know, how do we manage the diversity of maybe the disciplinary backgrounds in the room? We've talked a lot, the ISW facilitators, about who does this workshop work best for? Experienced mm -hmm. instructors, newer instructors. Um, what do you think, as a facilitator, what are the advantages of the workshop for a, an experienced instructor mm -hmm. and also for perhaps someone with less teaching experience? Sure. Well, I think um, ideally, you know, this is something that you would take when you first get a position in a, mm -hmm. in a post secondary institution. Because you do, as Uda said, you do have the content, the background knowledge of, of what it is that you're teaching, but you might not have the pedagogy, right? You might not know how to reach your students. So I'd say for brand new instructors, the first thing it does is it gives you knowledge of pedagogy, right? Mm -hmm. It helps you understand that there's more than one way to teach. And we're all going to teach the way we were probably taught until we mm -hmm. research other methods and find out that there are different ways. So it, it helps us not rely simply on our own experience as teachers. So I think, I think knowledge of pedagogy is one of the most important things for new people that, that the ISW provides. Um, then, and, and everybody's talked about this already, it's that sense of community. So you're in a brand new institution, maybe you're in a new, um, a new locale, somewhere you've never lived before, and you're going to be working you know, four days intensely with a group of people from all across campus. So not just in your discipline, and hopefully you, you get to know those people anyway, right? But you're going to have a chance to meet other people from across campus, and it's a very supportive kind of environment. And it starts with day one, and it continues throughout the process. But we're not putting people on the spot at all. Mm -hmm. This is a mm -hmm. way for each individual to identify goals for themselves, and work towards those goals in a way that's that's comfortable and, and supportive. So I think for, for you know, beginning instructors, the, the knowledge of pedagogy is there, as well as the sense of community and a supportive environment is also there. And, and then I think it's the resources that the ISW offers. So there's a lovely you know, book that comes along with it. And uh, sometimes you, you want to look through all of those resources before. It's not necessary to do that, though. We found that uh, we can start the ISW and then look at the resources mm -hmm. um, in the evening or even after the, the workshop's over. But what's so fabulous about having all of those resources there is that when you need them, you can go to them. Mm -hmm. So I know one of the um, areas that uh, a lot of the participants I've worked with over the years have been really interested in is participatory learning. Mm -hmm. So maybe all of their experiences as learners up until coming into the ISW has really been quite passive, mm -hmm. right? You sit down, somebody else will tell you what to do, uh, you read material, you tell someone what you've learned, but they haven't really had a lot of opportunities to participate in their learning, hands-on, interactive kinds of things. And, you know, learners today have been exposed to that way of learning. So our students are coming to us expecting to participate mm -hmm. in their learning in some way. So by being able to go to these resources, I think, either during the ISW or afterwards and say, okay, you know, Uta did this fabulous lesson on centers. What, what are learning centers, right? And then you can go to the ISW manual, you can read about it, it'll give you, you know, some ideas of how you might try it in, in your own discipline. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's for um, new people. But I think in terms of experienced people, and, and um, when I did the first ISW on campus here, we really, um, represented a variety of, of years of experience, right? Mm -hmm. And yet, um, we all left with something really important because we came with certain questions, whether we knew it or not, mm -hmm. like whether we'd actually identified them, that, you know, <laughs> there are things that we wanted to learn about improving, you know, our teaching. Um, we, we started to articulate those throughout the four days. So that for me personally, I know that I left thinking about my practice in ways I hadn't done for, for many years. Right? And often the only feedback we get on our teaching is through course evaluations, mm -hmm. right? And those mm -hmm. can be helpful and they can you know, help signal certain areas that maybe we want to, to learn more about. But it's really, it's so much richer if the questions about teaching and learning come from ourselves mm -hmm. and, and then you know, we get feedback from that from, from our colleagues. So, you know, I don't think that um, there's too many differences between why the ISW works for new people 
or experienced people. I really think it's around pedagogical knowledge, you know, community, and, and resources. I think mm -hmm. those three things matter regardless of where you are in your, in your teaching career. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think, you know, you've all touched on reasons why uh, the ISW is really meaningful and really valuable. And I think perhaps we've also found sometimes that without relating more of our personal experiences, sometimes you can't really get to what the essence is. So maybe if I could just now you know, ask you all to describe briefly um, why you took the ISW. And Robin's already touched on this a little bit, but why did you take it? And what did you think you got out of your first ISW when you were one of the participants? And I'll just start with Rita. Okay, well, I'll give a really bad answer because I totally <laughs> did not want to go to the first <laughs> ISW. <laughs> It was the first ISW on campus. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew what it is. And at the time, I was a young, new teaching fellow, and I was invited. And I felt I couldn't say no, but I really didn't <laughs> want to go. <laughs> so that's out there. Nevertheless, I got so much out of it that is beyond what I could have ever dreamed of. Mm -hmm. It changed my career. I really have to say, I, I was a rather young instructor at the time. And I, it changed the way I'm teaching, it changed the way I'm thinking, it changed the way I interact yeah. with colleagues on campus, it changed how many friends I have <laughs> now. And I could talk about that for hours, but it was really a transformative mm -hmm. event on many different levels, not just the actual teaching the classroom, but beyond. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wait? Uh, well, when I heard about it, I thought, I'd been teaching here for a number of years, and I thought, yeah, it sounds like something I could go try, just, you know, just I felt like I was in a rut, and you know, see what this is about, and and uh, and then uh, when I got in there, I actually learned quite a bit about uh, you know thing you know things that I thought maybe were working for me, but actually weren't working for me because uh, as Robin mentioned, you're getting the only feedback you get in your class is really your student evaluations. Those are at the end of the semester, and really that you know there's not really a lot of specific information there, uh, other than if they liked you or not, or maybe they maybe someone remembers something specific. But uh, this way, it gives you some specific information about. A certain thing you you want to pinpoint, so I got uh, I got some of that and found out oh these things actually, you know, I shouldn't be doing these things, <laughs> or, or or something that I didn't think was working actually did work. So so that's what I got out of it, I, I, uh, among other things. But that's one of the big things I got out of it is is just an, an kind of a an, an, and a new different way to think about how to how to teach my classes because like I said I you know I've been here for a while and you know it's good to try new things and so I'm. I've taken some of what I did in the ISW and tried to apply it to some of my classes. I think that's a really good point, if I could just pause there for a second. This isn't just about identifying areas that we all might want to improve on. It's also about having a group of your peers identify what you are really good at mm -hmm. and helping you build on your strengths. So this isn't just sort of for punitive games. <laughs> um, it can also be quite celebratory at times, mm -hmm. um, that, hearing that... your colleagues say, you are so good at this aspect of things. Mm -hmm. Why don't you play to your strengths more and, with that? And, and so. that can be that can be harder to hear than the, the criticisms <laughs> because when we talked about the feedback sessions and I said you have to sit there and take the good and the bad, it's because it's hard to take the good criticism. It's yeah. it's or not the good criticism, but the the, the you know the, the the feedback that says this is what you did really well. Mm -hmm. uh, it is it is very hard to hear that sometimes, and and you know all you're focusing on is what can I do better, you know what can I improve on, but you know you're not even thinking about you know what what really worked for them. So that, yeah. that, uh, that is a big part of the feedback, is taking the good with the, the constructive feedback. Yeah. And Robin, you had a really interesting perspective coming to the first one, because you've got a PhD in education. So <laughs> on the surface, um, the ISW might not seem to have offered much to you. So what made you say yes that summer? Well, yeah, there were a couple of things. I was incoming board chair. And um, one of my colleagues, Keith Roscoe, had heard about the ISW and I think been a part of it at another institution. Mm -hmm. And he sort of said, oh, you know, this is kind of an interesting approach to teaching. You know, would you like to have a look at it? And as soon as I looked at it, I felt the same way. I thought, well, I know all this. <laughs> 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 all right? I mean, there was no new, new terminology. Mm -hmm. There was, you know, nothing that I thought was, was going to change my life. And I was wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I thought, oh, but you're incoming board chair, and this is, this is bigger than you, right? So give it a try, right? Put your money where your mouth is, so to speak. And I was scared, I'll tell you. I was worried because it was a group of individuals that I knew of and admired and respected, but, you know, I'd never worked with any of, mm -hmm. of these people before. Um, so I was a little bit nervous, and, but what I, the way I approached it was, 
you know, you're here for a reason, right? And, and there's, there's going to be something to learn here. And as soon as I, you know, sort of met everybody that first day, I would say after the first morning, I was sold. <laughs> <laughs> I really was, because everybody was there for different reasons, but um, all such good people, um, everybody wanted to focus on teaching. Mm -hmm. I sort of feel like, how could you go wrong four whole days <laughs> talking about teaching? Mm -hmm. uh, and so what, what I took away um, was, yes, definitely um, thinking more deeply about my own practice and from a different point of view. And then... What was so interesting to me was how every discipline, every person represented a different discipline in that first ISW. Yeah. And whenever um, they undertook lessons, I learned something from every single person's lesson that you know informed my teaching in some way. So yeah, I took more risks when I got back into my own classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, I tried things that I hadn't tried before. And I felt a lot more confident doing it. Right? Because I thought, well, you know, I remember, you know, that the, you know, one of the instructors tried this, and it was nothing that I would ever try had I not had the opportunity to see someone do it, mm -hmm. get feedback, learn from, from that experience as well. So, yeah, I think you have to go into it. Well, you're going to go into the ISW thinking whatever you're thinking. It, you know, it doesn't, <laughs> sometimes you're going to be, you might be, you know, I don't know, nervous or scared or, you know, think you know, know more than, 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 um, you, than you actually do. But I think if you commit to it mm -hmm. and you sincerely, you know, um, uh, believe that you're going to learn something over four days, how could you not, you know, four days of professional development, that you'll come out with, with something, and I certainly feel like I did. Yeah. My experience was much closer to Uta's. It was all three. I was going to be coming in as a fellow with the teaching center beginning December of, no, sorry, January of 2012. So because it was brand new mm -hmm. and the teaching center, you know, wonderfully brought it in for us but needed to kind of test the waters a bit. So it was offered to me and at first I thought, okay, you know, it's four days of free training. Who turns down four days of free training? Mm -hmm. But then the manual came in the mail, and I thought, oh, dear. <laughs> oh, th th I am not going to enjoy this <laughs> at all. Because it was all of this, what to me at the time seemed like, it's all this edge jargon. Mm -hmm. And I don't, why do I need to know this? What has this got to do with anything? And, uh, and then day one, I really struggled in day one. And I went home from day one with a really bad headache, thinking, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> um, what am I going to get out of this? Because day one felt like all the knowledge that you already had coming in felt utterly foreign to me. Mm -hmm. But I liked the people. Mm -hmm. We had such a diverse group, in, on, uh, the original five. And I thought, OK, it's, it's, it's more free training, right? Like, it's, it's three more days of free training. Just, just go back. Mm -hmm. And for me, the turnaround was the second day when we got into the mini lessons. And I started really getting to know it, the others that I was in the group with and watching them teach. And then the first few feedback cycles. And then I was hooked, mm -hmm. absolutely completely hooked. And I think for me, the takeaway was, um, the people, first and foremost, mm -hmm. because we've kept in touch. Even that first year, we were having lunch together regularly after the ISW, and we've seen that with a lot of the subsequent mm -hmm. workshops. So it was the people. I had friends on campus now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in places that I would never have known anyone before, and I got all these new perspectives and other people's disciplines. Um, and then it was the content, for sure, and just being so inspired by four other teachers who teach radically different stuff than I do. <laughs> But their lessons were so cool, and they were so cool as people. Um, so yeah, I left with this confidence mm -hmm. and desire to take risks, and I just sort of madly reinvented everything I could reinvent <laughs> for the following year. And that turned out to have been a bit of a mistake. <laughs> but it was, for me, one of the central transformations of my career, kind of as, not just as a teacher, but as a mm -hmm. scholar. Mm -hmm. Because I think that it gave me insights, the insights into teaching teach you a lot about scholarship and about mm -hmm. other disciplines and about you know the funny silos that we think exist on this campus between a historian and a biochemist, mm -hmm. right? Or between someone in the Faculty of Arts and Science and someone in Ed or someone in Fine Arts. Um, so it's actually also broadened my view of what scholarship is mm -hmm. and how ridiculous some of these arbitrary distinctions are mm -hmm. because I got to see my fellow participants as teachers. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's something very personal about that. Mm -hmm. So that's partly why the four of us took it in the first place, against our will or not. Um, and, the, and those positives that we took away from it are why we then chose to become facilitators. Can you talk to me a little bit more about that? What made you want to go on, become a facilitator, and how those experiences have worked out since? So I'll start with you first this time, Wayne. 
It's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> well, for starters, I was told that I might make a good facilitator, so that sort of, yeah. that, uh, that, was, uh, uh, that gave me some confidence. Uh, I thought it might be, well, I had two excellent facilitators for my, <laughs> for my ISW, and I thought, you know, if I could even be half of that, that would be, that would be a, a pretty good. At that point, I was, I was in. I, was, I thought, you know, this, would be, this is something that it would be nice to be involved mm -hmm. with. It looks like a good core group of people that are involved with it, and, and, uh, and I, like, I, I enjoy hanging out with them, so, uh, so I want to take the next step. And so that's what I did. Yeah. Great. Robin? Oh, I, you know, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really sure that I ever thought that I wouldn't be a facilitator. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds terrible. Um, but but um, it's because of the people, just as you say, right? And it's not just the, the co-facilitator, so the person that you get to work with. And, and I love that a part of it because so much of the teaching that I know I do is all solitary, mm -hmm. right? You mm -hmm. plan your own mm -hmm. courses, you carry it out all on your own and evaluate all your students by yourself. And, you know, everything comes to you, right? And it's just so nice to have a co-teacher. Right? Someone you get to plan with, and at the end of the day, that's something that's really important at the end of every ISW day, is you and your co-facilitators sit down and you say, well, what was that like? You know, how, mm -hmm. how did we do? You know, and, and we notice things about the participants, and we try to you know, identify strengths and ways to work with those people. So the idea of having a co-teacher really appeals to me, mm -hmm. right? So I love that. So it's definitely about, about the people. And then every single um, session that I've been involved in so far has then led to getting to know all the people who take the ISW, mm -hmm. right? And so this, this ISW family keeps getting bigger and bigger. And the, the growth and development that you, you get to observe in yourself and those other people over four days is unbelievable. Right? So mm -hmm. we all talked mm -hmm. about, you know, coming in that first day and, you know, maybe being a little bit nervous, not knowing the people around us. By the end of the fourth day, it's just a whole different story, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. People um, are, are just so supportive of one another and, you know, and not that they make it easy on each other. Sometimes, you know, they ask those tough questions to get us, you know, to the next step. But, um, you know, overall, I think it's just... It's so nice, and we do it on a volunteer basis, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's – so you, if you didn't love it, you certainly wouldn't keep doing it. But I know m most of us give up. <laughs> I would, don't know if that's the right word. One or two extra weeks mm -hmm. every year mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. co-facilitate an ISW. So I think it, you're right. It's the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uta, why don't you go next? Well, I can, I can only mirror it, right? <laughs> it's the – I just want to hang out with the same people again. I, cannot possibly turn out free training. <laughs> but then, then there was more to it because I realized I had learned so much in the week and I wanted to keep mm. going, right? Yeah. I mean, it couldn't end after this week. That was just an impossible thought. Mm -hmm. So that's almost a, more like a selfish reason, thinking well, if I take the yeah, facilitator workshop, I get another week with mini lessons and feedback and <laughs> awesome people and I can learn from that. Plus, I can then go on and have more workshops. Yeah, I will be a facilitator, but I won't tell the participants, I learned as much as they yeah. do, right? So I felt it's, it's a pass for myself. But it, it wasn't just, just that selfish reason, because I've also seen in the first I started how much it transformed me, mm -hmm. how much mm -hmm. it inspired me, it motivated me, it enabled me, it gave me confidence, so many things. And I really felt we need this on campus. Mm -hmm. This really needs to become something that is common and not this weird unique thing that these crazy five people have done in this room <laughs> for a week but it needs to be something that is natural that is normal for us we expect our students to learn we should expect ourselves to learn and we have to create an environment where we help us learn mm -hmm. not just our students but just the next logic step to think about our students and then think about us as a community of teachers and how we really facilitate us and help us to be the teachers of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Our students keep changing. Robin mm -hmm. mentioned that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we can't teach how we were taught. It's mm -hmm. not what we are up to as a challenge at the university. Mm -hmm. We have to keep evolving. And we have not many mechanisms there. And I thought this is the one mechanism that actually works. Mm -hmm. So it's a no-brainer. It's no, -brainer. It's no mm -hmm. choice. We have yeah. to do this. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I don't think I've got too much more to add to that. We wanted to be able to have it completely in-house. Mm -hmm. You know, the original ISW, we had external facilitators, and then as soon as we were offered the opportunity to get trained so that we could begin facilitating our own college, colleagues, 
and have it a completely sort of closed, you know, U of L community, um, which sounds bad, and I don't mean it that way. But I mean to be able to facilitate our own colleagues it was such a great opportunity. Getting to spend more time with these amazing people was such a great opportunity. And then, yeah, I thought if, you know, if I can help other instructors on campus, if they have even a fraction of the takeaway that I had for my ISW, um, transforming their own practice, maybe meeting even one or two people that they really resonate with, if, if I can help somebody else get any of that out of this process. And yeah, for the first couple of years, there was kind of this, it seemed like a bit of a small band of really crazy people um, <laughs> trying to preach this <laughs> gospel um, on campus. And now it has grown, you know, luckily. But it, it's that chance to keep learning. Like every mm -hmm. ISW that I facilitate, I'm learning. I think, you know, I would I absolutely agree with that. I learn as much as they do. I get to meet four or five or six totally cool new people, um, watch their learning styles, and just keep improving, keep reflecting on my own teaching practice, yeah. Um, what else could we, how else could we frame it in terms of why others should take the ISW? Because we're obviously, we mm -hmm. are the early converts mm -hmm. here. We've taken the extra step of becoming facilitators and now we've seen, we've had a chance to reflect on the impact it had on us. We've seen the impact it's had on other colleagues who participated mm -hmm. with us. But how do we encourage more people to take the ISW? How else can we continue to uh, sell this or mm -hmm. grow the ISW family? I like that mm -hmm. word that you used mm -hmm. on campus. Why don't more people want to come take four days of free training and hang out with cool people? Well, I, and I think you, you said it right there. You know, I, I know I thought this whenever the ISW was first offered, four days in August. Yeah. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. You know, what could I be doing with those four days, right? I could be getting everything ready for, you know, the fall semester. I could be finishing up that article that, that I was working on, right? So I think sometimes what, what prevents us from engaging in it is just thinking of four days as this block of time that most of us, you would find it really hard to, to, um, to commit to. Mm -hmm. But what I, what I think we need to help people understand is, Four days is actually a really small <laughs> part of your entire year, and the potential payoff is that what you do for the next eight months, if you're teaching, right, mm -hmm. both semesters, um, is going to be tremendous. Like, you will feel inspired. So I know we've had um, instructors join us, and they, they've said the same thing, you know, oh, it's going to be this, this four days, and I was really worried about committing to that time. But at the end of the four days, they talk about being in a completely different mm -hmm. mindset for the fall semester. Mm -hmm. So instead of just thinking, okay, here I go again, I've taught this course, you know, 18 times. <laughs> instead, it's like, I, I'm going to try some new things I've never done before. And I do remi remember running into one of our ISW participants in about October. And she said, I, I'm in a completely different place. And I've been here 15 years, mm -hmm. but, you know, I was so inspired in that week, right, that I'm doing things differently, I'm trying new things, I go home and I'm not exhausted, I can hardly wait to think about what I'm doing the next week. So I, I think that that's one of the things we do have to work on mm -hmm. with, with our colleagues is to really remind them that, you know, four days out of your entire year is, is not a significant amount of time and the payoff is just so great. Mm -hmm. in, in terms of the uh, when we actually offer, you mentioned August, mm -hmm. and uh, um, what we've now done is we've tried to do it a couple times over the summer instead mm -hmm. of the last, mm -hmm. you know, in the last couple weeks of August mm -hmm. when, uh, you know, people might be thinking of taking the last gasp holidays before the semester starts. Mm -hmm. We started trying to offer it in May as well, uh, which has its advantages in that you're just coming off a semester mm -hmm. and uh, you may want to, you may still want to be trying mm -hmm. things that maybe you couldn't try during the semester. Uh, plus, it may work better for you in terms of timing. So we, we are trying to offer it more than or a couple of different times mm -hmm. during the summer, which mm -hmm. might help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've really learned to see it as not thinking, oh, I need this time because I could do this or this or this. I get caught up in all these daily tasks we have. Mm -hmm. But I see it now as, a, as almost a merger between holidays at a conference. It's yeah. four days where I take myself away from everything else, mm -hmm. which is a blessing, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I can just let everybody know I'm doing the ISW and have, I'm in this little bubble. Uh -huh. And it 
It is on, like a holiday because it recharges my batteries, as Robin <laughs> explained, right? It inspires me, it gives me the strength to go out and do the teaching, all the little tasks and all the work that I have to do. But it's so important to do this, right? We take our holidays so that we can work better. I mean, we all in a way workaholics. So why don't we take our time for, for those four days to get our teaching up to speed and, and comparing it with the conference, we all love our disciplines, right? And I, I assume it's for us, like for me, that I love going to a conference because for four days I can do this nerd talk with people who love it as much as I do. <laughs> and I can think about nothing else of the next yes. big questions to tackle. Why don't we do that with teaching mm -hmm. as well? This is like yeah. what it is. For four days, just focus on teaching, nothing else. Get inspired, get to the big ideas, mm -hmm. the real things that matters. Get new ideas, get inspired, come back and, and do them. And it's for free. I can't go to more conferences, unfortunately. I don't have enough money, but it's, <laughs> it's for free. Yeah. And Jill even makes sure from the teaching center that I get good food. So here we go. Yeah. It is really a little treat for yourself. Yeah. And I learned to see it this way, and not mm -hmm. as a commitment of four days, mm -hmm. but as four days as a gift to myself. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Because it's not just four days out of your year, it's four days out of your teaching career. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. a drop in the bucket. I wish I had taken it so much sooner. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd already been teaching her full time what, I guess, eight years when I was here, so I was already mm -hmm. nine or ten into my teaching career, and I wish I had taken it earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm so grateful that I've taken it now because it's going to continue to shape mm -hmm. all of the rest of my teaching career. The friendships mm -hmm. are going to continue to shape it, but I've got support. I left with inspiration yeah. um, and a new knowledge and a new vocabulary. And I know sometimes people outside of ed can be quite dismissive of the jargon, mm -hmm. right? We're always so dismissive of other disciplines' jargon and never our own. And for me, it's been really useful. Like, it actually helps enormously. There's a reason why people with ed degrees are able to think clearly and articulate objectives clearly, something that the rest of us are never trained to do, <laughs> right? In a course outline. You know, you go back to your earlier course outlines, and you just think, what was I thinking with this, like, you know, class objectives? That's not an objective. It's not measurable. It's not. <laughs> it's not. And outcomes and objectives are not the end all and be all. I do want to go on record saying that sometimes understanding is okay. <laughs> and that's not all we do in the end is don't use hammer away at those objectives. But it was a window into a way of thinking about teaching. And that for me was part of the value as well of that, you know, the jargon on day one, the stuff that you, you know, you could look at that material and find very familiar. And I just thought, this is so helpful, you know. Mm -hmm. I think we need a catchy slogan. Like I keep thinking of it, you know, you're four days away from being a happier and more effective teacher. <laughs> I right? like that. Four days, four days. <laughs> uh -huh. mm -hmm. Because I think it does make you more effective and also happier, mm -hmm. whether that's inspiration, whether that's mm -hmm. a sense of community, you know, whatever. Um, it does tend to build your confidence quite a bit too. Absolutely. The things yeah. that you think that you're, you're, you're not good at, suddenly you've got all these people telling yeah. you, boy, that was really good, that mm -hmm. you, how you did that. I really liked how you did that part that you maybe hadn't even considered before. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you realize you're better at it than you think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. As it, we were saying before, this isn't just about finding things, oh, you need to improve on this. Mm -hmm. Because I've rarely seen, in, in all the ones that I've now facilitated, mm -hmm. I've never seen a feedback session go sideways and become mm -hmm. something unkind or unproductive. Mm -hmm. You know, you talked about it, it varies from, you know, we're very gentle with each other often in that first round to by the final day together, you know each other so well that you're able to really push, but it's never been in an unkind or an unhelpful way. And it's always contextualized in terms of, you are so good at this, mm -hmm. I would love to see you be that good at this other area, mm -hmm. you know, of your teaching, um, and have this chance to really reflect on it, you know, sort of really deeply. What role do you think something like the ISW can play more broadly for pedagogy at U of L? This is only one piece mm -hmm. of what the teaching center offers. It's only one piece of sort of the broader peer support community even that we've got going now. But how does this, this one piece play a role um, for the broader teaching community at U of L? Maybe I'll start with you, Rob. Sure. Um, I would think, I think that one thing that um, it does that people don't really think about too much is it makes us focus on the student's perspective. Yes. And I think, you know, it's easy to get caught up in what we do as teachers, right? Did I bring in the right resources? Did my PowerPoint look okay? <laughs> you know, all of those kinds of things. And I, but what the ISW does is it says, okay, that's all fine. Do all those things, right, that, that you, you think about to be a good teacher. But now let's think about the effect it has on the students. 
the learners. Mm -hmm. And so there's always a set of learners in every ISW, and they come from a variety of backgrounds. And so what I really appreciate is that the ISW has made me really focus on that learner's experience and know that what a lesson that I might do you know, really resonates with one person, somebody else hated it and was really uncomfortable, <laughs> and two people, you know, kind of were all right with it, right? <laughs> and that's, that's a huge learning. So I would think, I think that's one of the things that the ISW offers, and that's one of its big roles, is mm -hmm. that it just really makes us focus on the students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uta, you want to go next on this one? Yeah. Well, I, I totally agree with mm -hmm. this. It's a core component to focus on the students. I think beyond that, it changes the culture of how we talk about teaching on campus. Mm -hmm. And it comes from the feedback, mm -hmm. right? Rain really mm -hmm. phrased it, right? Talking about teaching, being brave enough to give each other feedback, because mm -hmm. so often we just stay away from each other, having learned how to give feedback, including compliments, mm -hmm. right? Feedback where we don't have to be afraid, because it looks at the strengths and the areas where we can improve and make suggestions by bringing disciplines together. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. often we are stuck in the silos, you mentioned that. And I think this is a way of breaking that culture, acknowledging mm -hmm. the differences, acknowledging the strengths, mm -hmm. and seeing that by bringing it together, we can reach the next level. And um, the ISW reunion, Sheila organized that last <laughs> September, and it was mm -hmm. fabulous yeah. to see how many people were there. Mm -hmm. Everybody yeah. who couldn't come was so sorry they couldn't come. <laughs> so it showed the culture because mm -hmm. people wanted to meet. They mm -hmm. wanted to exchange. Mm -hmm. They wanted to learn from each other. They wanted to meet the other ISW participants. Mm -hmm. And it really, for me, exemplified the culture change. And I mm -hmm. think it's nothing less than this culture change mm -hmm. on campus. Mm -hmm. And the acknowledging of we need the positive feedback and we need the negative feedback. And we need the contact with other teachers. Just mm -hmm. doing it on, on your own. You mentioned that mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. Just being this isolated teacher in the classroom with this crowd of students. You don't know what's going on in their head. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to work like that because we are together with wonderful colleagues and we found the means mm -hmm. to help each other through this in a meaningful and useful way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah just, to, just to build on what you'd mentioned about the, uh, the culture of the university, Uda, the, mm -hmm. the whole, um, you, you've met a bunch of people, you, you yeah. maybe knew who they were, but you, you'd never actually done anything with them or talked mm -hmm. to them or anything mm -hmm. at, any, any, at any university mm -hmm. functions. And then at the, at the reunion, you met a bunch of more people. Maybe you weren't involved in their ISW, but you, you get talking. You all have that in common. <laughs> and now, you know, you see them around the university. You sit and chat yeah. with them. You, yeah. you go to a university function, mm -hmm. you know, some, some free meal or something that they have here or, or, or some social <laughs> gathering, and you see them there. You, you know, you might yeah. sit at their table when you, you never would have. You would have just sat at the, you know, at the table of chemists and biochemists, for <laughs> yeah. example, yeah. and just, just maintained yeah. yourself yeah. in that bubble where now you actually might mm -hmm. actually be going around and, and you know, sit with someone from health sciences, for example, yeah. that, that, you, that you know you want to chat with because you haven't seen them for a while and, and you want to know how it's going. So I mean, yeah. that, that, I think, is just gets the, 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 you know, the broader aspect of the university out there that we are, I mean, the university is a community in of itself. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, you just want to, you know, you really should get to know as many people in that community as, as, you, as you can or as, as you would like to. So. And the feedback process continues after the ISW. I mean, at least it certainly did for me. I, I think I've probably lost track the number of times I've gone back to my original ISW cohort or people I've co-facilitated with, um, with a problem I've got in my teaching or a new challenge or a new assignment or whatever. You know, the first year when I was trying to, re the first year after my ISW, when I was trying to really think through, what are my objectives in this class? What do I think I'm doing here? Um, and just without hesitation, there's a group of people who now, without hesitation, I would ask any question. Mm -hmm. None of you are in my discipline. Mm -hmm. And that is absolutely not the fundamental piece mm -hmm. of it for me anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I trust all of you. I trust all of my co-facilitators so deeply as teachers that I, any teaching question I have, I go back to my ISW mm -hmm. community first. I want to pick up on a point that you made, something we haven't <laughs> talked about yet. What is the value of being back in that learner position for the <laughs> ISW? Because I, I have been very aware of that myself, being back in the learner position. You're suddenly reminded of, who am I as a learner, for good or for bad? Mm -hmm. I've discovered I'm, I'm, 
I'm that completely obnoxious student in class, <laughs> right? I wanted to get the, the puzzle done first. I wanted to be the person with the answer. Um, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was a bit painful to remember that I, I am that student in class. It made me be more kind towards those annoying students because that was me 20 years ago. But it was interesting to be aware of um, you're in an ISW, you're a learner, and your peer is, you know, maybe they've got a PhD or they've been teaching for 20 years in their field or whatever, and you don't understand something they're telling you. And you realize, it, it, for me, it permanently ended any urge to dismiss, why can't students just understand what I'm saying? I have a PhD, and I can't understand what another very experienced instructor is trying to teach me about making a paper airplane, mm -hmm. or how to throw a disc in disc golf, mm -hmm. you know? And I thought, oh, okay. So for me, being back in that learner position was almost as transformative as having to be up there in the instructor position and get that feedback. Can you comment more on that piece of the ISW? You're not just in there as instructors or now as facilitators. We all remember and revisit what it's like to be a learner again. Uta, do you want to start with this one? Yeah. But it makes you humble, right? And it's important <laughs> <that's> because <laughs> so often we think we are the know-it-all uh -huh. and our students mm -hmm. feel like that and yeah. it doesn't help at all. And now you realize you know a lot, sure, but not everything and you can't do everything and it brings you back to this humble approach of mm -hmm. that your mm -hmm. role as a teacher is to help them learn. Mm -hmm. Your role is not mm -hmm. to teach. Your role is to help them yes. learn. And for me, it really turned this perspective around. Robin talked about mm -hmm. that a bit. It's not mm -hmm. about what mm -hmm. I do this, I do that. It's what, what do my students learn? And you realize it's, mm -hmm. it's their perspective that matters and might be different from you. So I really appreciate, for that reason, the diversity in the ISWs. Mm -hmm. I had a few moments where it was like, you like, gee, I'm not getting it. But I also had eye-opening moments where I had a mini list that I loved and was happy and I enjoyed it. came <laughs> to the feedback cycle and to my big surprise, <laughs> two other participants mm -hmm. had not gotten anything out of it. Mm -hmm. And I realized mm -hmm. it might work for one student, but not mm -hmm. for the other. Mm -hmm. And our role as a teacher is to address the diversity mm -hmm. and to make it work for as many as possible. Mm -hmm. Not sure if it's possible for all. And I sure learned in my classes to tailor to more different students. Mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. really yes. taught myself to, to teach to the ones that are like me and not to the others. Mm -hmm. And that's unfair, right? Yeah. Because they are not yeah. better or worse, they're just different. And I learned that I'm not better or worse, I'm just <laughs> different. Yeah. Right. So yeah. yeah, it makes you humble and, and it's the first step to really think about students first. We say that so often, student first, but it's a question of how do we actually do it and mm -hmm. not just say it. Mm -hmm. Wait. Um, yeah, for, well, for me, just being in the learner actually, it was, it was the feedback, being, you know, having to give the feedback to the instructor that actually was, uh, was uh, quite the hurdle for me. <laughs> And, uh, you know, just try, you know, the, and the good and the bad. And that actually is, has helped me out quite a bit in my role as a, as a TA supervisor uh, in just giving feedback to my TAs on their yes. teaching. Yes. Um, just, you know, being comfortable giving the feedback and, and uh, you know, giving them both, you know, constructive, you know, feedback and telling them what they did good. So that's, that's one thing I really got out of just being a learner was just, the, just how, to, you know, how to structure the feedback. Yeah. Which I'd, I'd actually never thought of before. Just sort of, I'd go to a class and be like, oh, yeah, that was okay. And, or, you know, I'll, I'll have to read up on this later, or I got this completely. But, you know, but actually giving the feedback about it was, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd, you know, never really forced myself to do that till then. Yeah. I think most of us haven't. And it you, mm -hmm. it's becomes a very finely honed skill mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah. over your ISW and then your FTW training and then any future ISWs that you facilitate, you give so much feedback. Um, mm -hmm. And you, again, you have a bit more humility perhaps with your student evaluations mm -hmm. and, you know, how frustratingly brief or inarticulate <laughs> they mm -hmm. are sometimes. Right. Yeah. But Robin, yeah. what would you want to add on to that shift yeah. in perspective? Yeah, just I, I remember being lots of lessons and being worried. Like, like yeah, as a learner, right? <laughs> so, you know, and, and like, like, you know, everybody said, you know, we're, you know, we know that we can learn and that we've been very successful learners to get where we're at. Mm -hmm. But I remember, okay, this is going to be a lesson in biochemistry. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, are you ready? So I remember yep. even before the lesson started, like being nervous and then thinking, well, I'm pretty sure that's how my students are when they get into education that first day. Mm -hmm. This is something, this is a mm -hmm. brand new mm -hmm. discipline for them. Mm -hmm. They come from history and they come from biochemistry. They, you know, they come from all the disciplines, but 
I, you know, I, I really do appreciate how they must feel those first few days because I was, I was nervous with just about every <laughs> single yes. mini lesson as it started because yeah. it was away from my yeah. area of, of yeah. understanding and expertise. So I do remember those feelings. Yeah. And, and I, now I think that I pro, uh, approach like differentiating things. So when I start to realize that, you know, students don't learn in the same way, maybe I get in an assignment and just it's totally bombed. Mm -hmm. Right. And in the past, I would, you know, I would talk to that student and, you know, try to help them understand it so they, they could be successful. But I think I always did it with the thinking, OK, I'll do this for you. You know, and I know mm -hmm. that doesn't sound very nice, but I think that's how I, I yeah. approached it. Yeah. I not anymore at all. It's like, OK, uh, something didn't happen here. I take 50 percent of that on for why mm -hmm. it didn't work for you. Right, and you take fifty percent, and now let's find out how to help you learn this material. So I think my attitude has shifted. Like it, instead of thinking that okay, you didn't get it, but and I'll help you, and mm -hmm. you know, yay me. Right? <laughs> I I don't think I do that anymore. I think it's more like okay, something didn't happen here, and I'm far more you know understanding of that because. I was in that situation, and I really appreciated when my colleagues, you know, Tate made a mini lesson understandable for me, and didn't make me feel stupid, and yeah. didn't make me feel like I did something wrong because I didn't get it, but that they just, they really um, encouraged me. So I think that's a, a big learning from mm -hmm. it as well. Yeah. I wonder in a way if that's one of the specific pieces that a more experienced instructor can get out of the ISW. Mm -hmm. A new instructor has perhaps only just recently finished being a student. Mm -hmm. Their memories of being that student, of being that learner are more still quite fresh in their minds. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, but as more experienced instructors, we've all been out of that role for a long time. It might also, it might perhaps be something that the more experienced instructors can particularly benefit from mm -hmm. when they come back into the ISW is be back in that feeling again. Mm -hmm. Remember how it feels to be a student. Be unclear. I've been the participant in many lessons, you know, whether they're sort of quite complex science experiments, <laughs> uh, which not everyone tackles as a mini lesson. Um, <laughs> Two things that are meant to be like you know, very silly and accessible and fun, and I get stuck on the first step. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I get stuck on the definition of a word, or I get stuck on. You know, I just get stuck on something. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been, for me, one of the valuable things about this is it's this annual reminder because I do at least one of these every summer. It's an mm -hmm. annual reminder that my students are nervous that I am not nearly as clever or clear in my instructions <laughs> as I think I am. <laughs> Um, and they're all hearing very different things. If five highly intelligent people can manage to misread what you thought for very clear instructions about <laughs> yeah. how to make a paper airplane or you know whatever, um, <laughs> then what do you think your students are feeling when you're asking something more sophisticated of them? Right. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about the mini lessons and how central they are to the process. And sometimes that's the piece that really scares people. Is, oh, I have to do a 10 minute mini lesson. And we particularly encourage people to try not to do something in their own field to get them away from thinking about content and play more with the how and the why and have a little bit of fun with it. So why don't we talk maybe briefly about many lessons we either we've given ourselves or fun ones that we have participated in in some of our ISWs. Robin, do you want to start? Sure. I know the very first mini lesson I did was how to make a paper airplane. <laughs> and, and one of the reasons was because it would let me um, really follow the box, right? So I wanted mm -hmm. to follow that lesson organization and, and make sure that I had all of the components in there. But what I, but I, what I came away from you know, learning with, by using that particular mini lesson was that you know, everybody, again, participated in different ways. Some people absolutely loved it. Some people were felt really uncomfortable uh, you know, with the instructions. And so I, I, that was one of my very first mini lessons. Mm -hmm. And I think, what, yeah, it was a great place to start because it was a little bit lighthearted. Um, and it did let me focus on, on the content of, of lesson planning, so mm -hmm. to speak, right? Yeah. <laughs> Wayne? Uh, well, uh, I went against the rules. And actually, my very first mini lesson of my ISW was uh, actually something I did in my mm -hmm. in my uh, my le one lecture course. The difference between precision and accuracy, and there is a difference. But uh, I did it the way I did it in my class, which was I used the uh, disc golf putting. And you've alluded to this already, Sheila, <laughs> on my disc golf uh, putting. And 
And so I did that lesson, learned some things. And, and one thing I learned, and I, I've known this ever since uh, my education days, was that you can't bring stuff into class and not expect the students to not want to play with them. Mm -hmm. So my next lesson then was disc golf putting, was how to putt with, uh, you know, mm -hmm. use the disc to putt into a, a basket. Mm -hmm. And so we did a whole mini lesson on that. And that was, and, and uh, doing something like a hobby is, is nice because you don't focus on your content. You focus, like you said, on the bops and the, the structure. But my goodness, it is hard to distill that down into 10 minutes sometimes. And you really have to focus on that too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, I'm a scientist, so I decided I will go out of my science teacher at university and do what I do in my, as my hobby almost, going to, and do science with children. So I figured, ah, if the children can do it, I can do DNA <laughs> extractions with my colleagues. And I had to learn that. Clarity of instructions, <laughs> boy, I can improve on that. And time management is obviously not my strength because if you haven't get it done in 10 minutes, it's very challenging. So what I thought was the easy lesson turned out to be quite a challenge. So I learned a lot from that, and I thought I'd really you know, gone the easy way there. But what I also appreciate is I've seen a number of lessons that really try to go to very deep level thinking, the way we teach, mm -hmm. even on our first year or graduate classes. Mm -hmm. um, which is so challenging, and I, I can't really don't want to cite all my colleagues what they've done, but I tried my own step at it, going totally out of my comfort zone, discussing how to give feedback. We did that during our facilitator workshop, and I decided we I have to use different means than I usually do. So, the scientists tried to facilitate role playing, which didn't go very well, but it taught <laughs> me to try things out and mm -hmm. to try to get to deep levels of learning, mm -hmm. even in ten minutes, and then we have to keep challenging ourselves to start at the surface and then dig deep. So mm -hmm. it was a totally crazy unsuccessful lesson and I learned so much out of it. I don't think the participants learned anything. I don't think they remember <laughs> anything, but I did. So mm -hmm. I guess it was still effective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think that's the challenge of the 10 minute lesson because some of our participants initially sort of resist that. Well, my field is far too important and compli complicated to be reduced to a mere 10 minutes. Like, absolutely, that's not the point. Mm -hmm. What can you do in 10 minutes? And that was another one of the big steps for me was, what can I do in 10 minutes? Clearly, effectively, with active participatory learning, what can I do in 10 minutes? And then extrapolate that to your classes. Instead of getting all hung up on my concepts are far too deep and complicated to be reduced to a mere 10 minutes, like, okay, let's put that aside mm -hmm. and let's have fun for 10 minutes. So I've challenged myself to try to come up with sort of, you know, the anti to mini lessons. <laughs> <laughs> What's, what's the simplest yeah. thing, the You've simplest thing I can model? <laughs> you know, for participants on day one, if you're, if you're modeling a mini lesson, you don't want them to get too freaked out and think that they've got to bring in a science experiment the next day. So I've done how to do a simple yoga pose. Yeah. Yeah. And then I borrowed an idea from somebody else about how to fold a fitted sheet. And that was fun because I just brought in a bunch of fitted sheets, threw them up in the air, they landed in a pile. And then I had everybody kind of stand around and start working on, you know, like effective ways to fold a fitted sheet. It turns out to be one of the most fun parts, really, is, is other people's mini workshops. Mm -hmm. That mini yeah. lesson sticks in your head. And, and you learn so much about the participants just in the, in, just in the, <laughs> the mini lessons they do of their hobbies. You learn so much about yes. them. Yes. Uh, yeah. And you just bond with them further yeah, because you, yeah. you find you maybe have a, a common interest in a, in a hobby or, or something. A too. Or, or, or a disinterest. Yeah. <laughs> or a disinterest. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Well, thank you all so much for coming and talking about the ISW today. And we look forward to another summer, two more faculty workshops, mm -hmm. and hopefully we get another. And a grad student one. And a grad student one. We're but not a grad summer. student one for the first time. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully we will grow our ISW community a little bit more. We're training some new facilitators this summer mm -hmm. as well. So that's going to be a lot of fun. I think it's become a permanent piece of the teaching landscape here at L now. So thank you all for coming today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you.